two royal health scares and a week of explosive royal revelations have we got a show for you today. Hello and welcome to Palace Confidential. I'm Jo Elvin and joining me this week is the Daily Mail's royal editor, Rebecca English, the Mail on Sunday's royal correspondent, Natasha Livingston, and the Daily Mail's diary editor, Richard Eden. Welcome to you all. Now, we were hit with a double blow yesterday as spokesman for the King and the Princess of Wales announced that they would both have to undergo hospital treatment, meaning that they would have to take time out of royal duties. Rebecca, I'm going to start with you. You always know everything. Let's start with the King. And what have we been told? And why have we been told what we've been told? This is extraordinary. It is extraordinary. And I think that cannot be overstated, actually. Um, what we do know is uh, I got a message from the palace yesterday, along with some of the other royal correspondents saying, no, it's a busy day for you, because obviously, and we'll go on to discuss this, we'd only learned about an hour before about the Princess of Wales. But we need to tell you this. And they were very open and said that the king had been diagnosed with this enlarged prostate and was going to have to undergo surgery next week. They're stressing that it's benign, there's nothing to worry about. But obviously they made the point straight away that we normally wouldn't share this level of detail with you. But the king personally feels this is really important because it is such a prevalent problem for men, um, especially over there at 50s. I think in, in his age group, it's it's 80% of the population in the UK mm. will experience this problem. And it's very treatable as long as you actually diagnose it and go and get it checked. And that's what he wanted to encourage people to do. Indeed. Now, Richard, it, it is unusual to get this level of detail about royal health concerns. Is this is this a whole new era or is this, what do you think? Gosh, I was really surprised when I, when I read that because We've become used to, you might remember um, in the final years of Prince Philip's life and, and then in um, Queen Elizabeth's life, they were often very enigmatic with their statements. You would say the Queen's suffering from periodic mobility issues, or they might say that Prince Philip's in hospital with an infection, mm -hmm. something like that. And it would turn out, you know, he would be dying uh, and that they would give very little detail. So to give this kind of full detail that they've given um, is very interesting. and. I should say it follows other developments such as I do think Sarah Duchess of York that when she had her um, breast cancer operation not only did she give a lot of detail but she felt you know what I'm going to use this as an opportunity to try to do something to help to yeah. encourage other women it's not something to be ashamed of often in royal circles poor health has been seen as something kind of embarrassing or something to be ashamed of so she was very open about it and from what I hear that's um, done a lot of good. So I presume the king will be hoping that, you know, talking about prostates, things like that for us men, it's it's embarrassing. It can be. And he hopes, presumably, to reduce some of that stigma. Yes. And Rebecca, obviously, a lot of people also worried about the news about Catherine. What a day you say. What, what, what do we know and why do we think it did come out the same day as the news about the king? It was a genuine coincidence. And even in palace circles, they were saying it was an unfortunate coincidence. But um, it was really a kind of perfect storm of events. Obviously, they wanted with Catherine to get her into hospital and to have her operation and to know it was a success before they announced the news. Uh, the King actually only got his diagnosis on Wednesday and uh, doctors immediately said, look, you need to scale back on some of your public engagements. And they realised the next day he was holding a big event at Dumfries House and had cabinet and ministers flying up from London. So they were going to have to cancel a lot of people. Yeah. And they've learned, I think, from the experience of the past when, as you rightly alluded to, the, the rumours about the late Queen and Prince Philip would go wild because they didn't want to comment on it. They would People would start wildly speculating and they didn't want to get into that sort of territory. So it was like, look, actually, we're going to announce this. We're going to be straight about it, you know, because we have got to cancel so many people. We don't want the rumour mill to start again. Um, but it was, you know, it was unfortunate timing and even the palace were remarking it was a bit of a, you know, a more dramatic day than they'd... Uh, entirely wanted it to be. Yeah, and it's interesting because we know details about the King's health issue, but we are left with, and we won't speculate because we don't know what exactly is wrong with Catherine, and we will, you know, unless they decide to announce it. But Natasha, it, it does sound serious. The recovery time is quite long. 
Yeah, she's going to be staying in hospital for 10 to 14 days and then we've been told not to expect her at any royal engagements until potentially after Easter and that includes any overseas travel and obviously Rebecca reported before Christmas um, that there was an expected trip to Rome which presumably is on hold now um, and the Princess of Wales has become a really important figure in the royal family so it's really um, feeling that sort of impact of the stripped back monarchy now that she's kind of out of action. Well, And of course um, by default it, it rather means that William is out of action. Yeah, he's going to be um, looking after the Princess of Wales and also their children. And so he's kind of yeah pushing back some of his engagements. So yeah, it's really going to have a big impact. All of the royal correspondents uh, were invited to the sort of media. Um, I mean, pen sounds a bit grim, but it's a sort of position uh, that they'd put made you, outside. You know the your place, Natasha. Yes. Get in that pen. <laughs> yeah. um, and it was really so there was a kind of vantage point um, for kind of photographers and broadcasters and journalists to see the hospital, see any comings and goings, but also mainly for the privacy of of the princess, but other people at the hospital. So they were kind of a step back. But yes, yeah, so we were all kind of there in the pen when we all got the news about the king, and it really was. Uh, it was quite astonishing, really, to get so much news. It really was very dramatic. It is quite dramatic, isn't it? Because, Richard, in your newsletter this week, and a reminder that you can sign up to that below, you talk about the challenges of losing two senior members of the firm and actually effectively three at the moment. I think, for me, it just highlights the precarious sort of nature of King Charles's vision of this slimmed-down monarchy, which, remember, his vision for the future was the king and Queen Camilla, and then it was... Prince William, Catherine, and then Prince Harry and Meghan. Well, they're gone, and now you've got, you know, almost three people out of action. And it sort of, for me, emphasises how that that vision is a very dangerous one. And, you know, personally, I think there's much more strength in the monarchy to have a wider circle of people involved. Mm. The difficulty is, and Princess Anne's been asked about this before, when they said, oh, are you going to be stepping up now? And she said, how can I step up more than I am? I already do 400 engagements a year, massive commitments. You know, I'm doing everything I can. So, I mean, remember, we discussed last week how um, Prince Richard, the Duke of Gloucester, who's in his 70s, yes. you know, he um, c carried out so many engagements. You know, it was more than Prince William last year. So, you know, people like him carry on um, doing lots of hard work, but, you know, they're the supporting act and mm. it's, it's those principles that we need. And Rebecca, what do you think we can expect in the next few days in terms of any further announcements? Can you hazard a guess at that? So, um, late last night I spoke to Kensington Palace and I was told that she was doing well after her surgery but they didn't really want to get into a situation with what we describe as a running commentary so they made very clear when well, we've got to say something we'll, we'll say something I think it, we can expect that she'll see visitors over the next few days uh, I know her children haven't been to see her yet understandably I suspect they want her to be a little bit better before yeah. that happens um, and you know it's a big deal for three young children to, to go to a hospital and see their mother in a hospital bed and that's completely understandable. Um, as for the King, I touched base with Buckingham Palace this morning um, and very much again they feel like he'd made the point because I said look he, you know has he been keeping in tabs on the the positive impact of this and he's not that egotistical he's like, like I want to make the point I want to encourage people and then hopefully you know, things will take its course and the charities certainly seem very pleased. So, you know, I think we might, we'll we probably get an update in the next 48 hours, but I'm not expecting kind of regular daily, you know, or even hourly updates mm. on either of their situations. Well, it goes without saying, really, that we all wish them both a speedy recovery here at Palace. We, we wouldn't be here without them, so we love them. But now, moving on, Daily Mail columnist and royal biographer Robert Hardman has written a new book on King Charles with some fascinating insight into the monarch, the family and the last tumultuous 12 months. We have three clips of him in the show today, and here's the first where he's talking about how the king has risen to the role and his relationship to his eldest son, William, Prince of Wales. What I found was a very sure-footed, very contented monarch. I think at the time of his accession, in those very sad, slightly febrile days of September 22, there were a lot of people thinking, well, you know, how can anyone fill the shoes of, of Elizabeth II? Um, and I think he has done, um, with aplomb, I think, uh, right from the start. Um, there, was no, there were no sort of question marks, there was no sort of news vacuum, there was no, well, what, what's going on? You know, he had very clear plans. He hadn't discussed them with anyone, really. I mean, you know, even some of his closest staff were still having to ask kind of questions right away. You know, what do we do about this, sir? What about that? 
Um, because I think he felt it would have been entirely inappropriate to be talking about this stuff while his mother was alive, so he simply didn't. But I didn't mean he hadn't thought about it. And all the way through that period, um, you know, he's in this extraordinary position of, he's lost his mother. I mean, normally if most of us lose a parent or a loved one, we get given time off. It's, well, you take a few days off work, go and sort yourself out, you know, we'll leave you in peace, so sorry. You're king, and you've got to, you're going through that process, but everyone's expecting you to grieve on their behalf. I mean, you know, when he was going into the crowds on day two, there were people who wanted him to hug them because they were so upset. And you're thinking, well, you know, he's lost his mother and he's having to console them. But that's, that's how it goes. That's, that's the unique thing about leading the nation. That's what you have to do. And he, um, he, he as I say, hit the ground running. And the, all those, those sort of speeches, all the various decisions that had to be made, I mean, that, that struck me as, as, as interesting. Another very interesting aspect, which I hope comes through in the book, is... I think it nails this lie that you see in shows like The Crown, which sort of depict him as being uh, an impatient middle-aged prince desperate to get his hands on the levers of power and have his turn on the throne. Absolutely not. You know, he did not want this to happen a moment before it did. He was very stoical about it. You know, when it comes, it comes. That's it. And as he said to um, more than one of my interviewees, actually, you know, I, I didn't didn't want this a moment sooner, you know, it came when it came, and now I'm going to grip it, grasp it and get on with it. You look back through history, history is full of um, tensions between a monarch and the heir, I mean it goes with the territory. Actually, the exception in many ways to that rule was, uh, was Princess Elizabeth and, uh, and George VI, but you know, all through the late Queen's reign, and particularly in those final years, I mean the Prince of Wales was a very solid, dependable um, substitute who was really sort of doing the, doing a lot of the heavy lifting, um, without in any way sort of um, stepping into her into the Queen's shoes. And I think now we see with he's king, and and, and Prince of Wales William is a very you know, he's very solid, very dependable. He's like his father in many ways. I mean, they love the environment, they love the outdoors, similar sense of humour. Um, they take a different approach on some things. Um, I think the Prince of Wales is, uh, as someone said to me, he's a regular guy. You know, he, he, likes, he likes watching action flicks and box sets and, um, you know, cheesy jokes and, and messing around in the garden with the children. Um, the king more into his you know, classical music, his Shakespeare, um, thick books about you know, big subjects. Um, so they're, they're different in that regard, but I mean, they, they totally get what it's all about. It's about you know, getting on with the job. And you understand that um, you know, monarchy is there to sort of represent the nation to itself. It's not all about you. Um, and I think William is, is, uh, is proving a, a, a very dependable, um, solid, and, and, and a prince in, and princess of Wales, um, and we wish her well. Robert Hardman's book, Charles III, New King, New Court, The Inside Story, is out now, and there will be a link to buy it in the description below, and we'll have more from it throughout the show. Rebecca, what changes have you noticed in the way our new monarch does things compared to the Queen? Uh, there are a lot. Um, I wouldn't quite call it more relaxed, but there's a definite informality, a, a notable informality to what he does. I mean, I think actually in Robert Harmon's book, he describes it as a kind of uh, informal, formal monarchy. And I think that's a really good description of it. I think we've seen a big difference in terms of the, the kind of engagements they do and the receptions they hold. Um, for example, you know, we saw uh, Queen Camilla hold a big reception uh, for people associated and working with the domestic violence sphere. And that's not the kind of thing we would have seen before with Queen Elizabeth. She might have done an event for a specific charity rather than a kind of the big issue she was supporting. And actually, when you go to these royal engagements, 
they're quite quite different now. The Queen, late Queen, really liked quite formal setups. So you would see, and it was it was almost done like a ballet. It was very brilliantly done. You see her staff seamlessly moving around the crowd and getting a few people into a group. So she knew before she was going to go, and they would say, "Mom, this is who this people is." They'd have their names on their cards. Was when you go to kind of the King and the Queen's receptions now, everyone's milling around. People are handing out drinks, handing out canapes. It's a it's a lot more. It's a lot more informal again, um, and there seems to be kind of a bit more of an air of a party around it, um, and a kind of free flow of of ideas. So you can really see changes like that as well. Is it really terrible of me to say the couple of Buckingham Palace events I've been to, all the equerries, all the, the couple, they're so <laughs> handsome. Uh, well, <laughs> I have to work with these people, it's so I shouldn't really say. It's not just that captain that everyone fancied from the coronation, let me tell you. He's obviously got a thing for men in, man in uniform, <laughs> maybe, Joe. Maybe, you? maybe. <laughs> Let's move on. Natasha, now, William obviously has a very important role. Any disagreements, any tension between he and Charles, it, it kind of has just has to stay in the past and to get on with it. Do you think that's possible? Yeah, well, I mean, he's obviously another man in uniform, so... <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, it's very clear that they have had William had a difficult childhood and that impacted their relationship they have different personalities again Robert Hardman's book kind of touches on that Prince William for example he's more of a box set man whereas you know King Charles loves to read you know and they have different approaches to religion and that you know could have a very significant impact when Prince William becomes king um, but also I think everything that's happened with Prince Harry um, leaving the royal family has brought them closer together and it seems like they have a really positive relationship now. Mm. Richard Robert does paint a an interesting portrait of the new era. What, what did you make of it? The, very interesting. I mean, there's so many different aspects to the book which we've been enjoying, you know, reading in detail. And um, I mean, what interested me particularly was um, Robert's suggestion about um, Prince William's future role as Supreme Governor of the Church of England. Um, he suggested that Prince William might be the first monarch in um, 500 years to cut that tie which is, would be sort of revolutionary and yeah. would be a hell of a change. Um, and I personally hope that's not the case. It seems to be almost like a misunderstanding that in, in our country, if you're going to be the monarch, you are head of the church. That comes with the territory. You can't pick and choose what you do. So, you know, it's like if you're a policeman, you might want to catch criminals, but you also have to do a lot of form filling. Well, mm. if William's going to be king, he also has to be head of the church. He can't choose that. So I'm hoping that over the next few years, people will point that out to him. But remember that he, for example, has already, um, he chose not to have any investiture ceremony when he became Prince of Wales. Well, for Charles, that was a big event. It really was. It when was, he was quite nutty, wasn't it? He was crowned. It? It, yeah. And we've talked about some of the fascinating details yeah. of that investiture before. On the, yeah. on the coronet. Yes. On his, I on always his love crown. that detail. Yeah. Um, and so, but William said, no, I don't want that. Um, so it's it's been, you know, a very interesting suggestion, but time will tell what actually happens. And we'll be here on Palace to talk about it when <laughs> that happens. I promise you that. Now, what is in a name? Well... An awful lot, if you're a member of the royal family. Here's Robert Hardman again, this time talking about the controversial decision by the Duke and Duchess of Sussex to give their daughter the late Queen's nickname, Lilibet. One of the things that's attracted a lot of attention is this story about the naming of the Sussex's second child, Lilibet. And uh, at the time, some people thought that's a slightly um, interesting choice of name. It was obviously a unique name. It was the Queen's childhood nickname. No one else has ever been called Lilibet. Um, and there was, soon afterwards at the time, the Sussex had issued a statement saying, you know, that the Queen had been supportive about um, this choice of name. And then it was the BBC that uh, reported, um, actually, no, the Queen wasn't asked. Um, at which point the Sussexes that reached for the the, the, you know, the legal red button and started issuing legal proceedings. And at which point the palace <coughs> was not willing to endorse the Sussex's version of events. Um, there was a, a resounding silence. Um, and as a result, the, the legal action didn't happen. The issue really was not the naming, the choosing of the name Lilibet, um, I mean, the Queen, is, you know, she's, she's put up with all sorts of things through her long life. Um, that wasn't 
for her, that was not the, the, the thing that, that caused the, the reaction inside the palace. What, what, what you can't ever do is you can't put words in the mouth of the queen. You can't say, she said this, she did that, if she didn't. And that was where the, 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 the crux of the issue was the fact that um, this choice of name that had clearly been presented as a fait accompli, and perhaps she did say, oh, well, that's very nice, or oh, oh, how interesting, or she'd often say how interesting, actually, to things. Um, you know, that's, that's as maybe, but it's when um, she was being expected and the palace were expected to say that this had happened and it hadn't happened, that's what um, got her upset. Oh, Richard, this was quite the revelation, wasn't it? It really was, and this, for me, has, it really, in, in a way, it's sort of changed our, our view of many people of Queen Elizabeth, because lots of people sort of saw her as a sort of sweet old grandma, um, and I think Prince Harry and Meghan were very keen to put this idea that, yeah, she was a sweet grandma that would approve anything we did. He w Harry would always talk about the sort of men in grey suits who would keep me from her, and this sort of thing. Well, actually, it turns out, you know, she really was an iron fist beneath mm. that velvet glove. And, you know, this was her being angry about something. This is what Robert reports. And this is over the, um, the choice of name. And it, and it wasn't just over the choice of name, which I think she may have felt was presumptuous and was, you know, perhaps an attempt to sort of take advantage, really, to sort of make commercial advantage. Remember, they'd already registered the name Lilibet as a domain name for a, for a website, um, but also it was um, it, it, it was something which just I think angered her on many different levels. I'm going to ask the question for balance because I've seen a lot of people on Twitter, sorry X, saying things like, you know, in in any other walk of life it's a great compliment. In any other walk of life you don't need to ask anyone's permission to name your child whatever name you want. Why, why has this caused such a problem and it's a fair question but I think if they stuck to the name Elizabeth then then it wouldn't have been because so many of the Queen's female grandchildren great-grandchildren have Elizabeth as a middle name in her honour but Lilibet was a really personal affectionate nickname given to her by her grandparents, her parents it was used by her grandfather her husband and really her closest friends and relatives. So to have this thing so personal, adopted by somebody else, it just feels a little uncomfortable. And I know she was uncomfortable about it. And, and following your front page story about the Queen's fury over this whole instance, you had a fascinating follow up as well, didn't you? What can you tell us? Yeah, because I think as, as Richard has, has kind of highlighted, it's important to stress that it was Robert's book focuses on her anger about how it was all done and he's made the point very clearly you know the Queen is a woman who didn't like words put in her mouth and when they called and said you know we're going to do this and then started sabre rattling using their very aggressive firm of lawyers mm. to threaten people to say no no your version of events is not true our version of events is not is, is true we wouldn't have used it unless the Queen had been supportive that really angered her you you don't do that to her what I was told was also that she was uncomfortable about the use of the name as well it wasn't that she was angry per se angry has never been a word that's been used to me. But she was felt kind of boxed into a corner. Things were so difficult with Harry and Meghan. You know, when Harry rings up excitedly saying, we want to call our granddaughter, uh, our daughter Lilibet and tribute it to her, she didn't really feel that she could say no. You know, she yeah. was a polite woman and also didn't want to exacerbate the situation. But she said to a senior aide, as I was told, that, look, I don't own the palaces, I don't own the paintings. Uh, the one thing I have is my name, and now now someone's taken that. Mm. Um, uh, it's important to stress. I think the reason why she said that was because actually she doesn't own the palaces and the paintings because she's basically a conservator for them for future generations and for the nation. Yeah. So they've taken something very personal to her. I, you know, it's important to stress. I don't say she was angry about that, but she was frustrated, I think. And I think, frustrated, I think, she'd been boxed into that corner. I think we should remember the context of it as well. well. You know, this was a couple with Harry and Meghan who had already been attacking the royal family in the most personal way in the Oprah Winfrey interview. So on the one hand, they're attacking. Then on the other hand, oh, here's a lovely tribute to my grandma. 
Well, you can imagine her feeling. Hmm, this is yeah. this feels manipulative. You know, I, I, I can imagine it just made her feel a bit uncomfortable. Has anybody、uh, heard from the Sussexes in the wake of the? All the, the, the revelations. No, there hasn't been anything、um, yet. Although there have been some suggestions from the, the regular cheerleaders, like Omid Scobie, sort of, oh, it's all nonsense. You know, the Queen, Queen Elizabeth approved the name.、Um, you know, obviously Queen Elizabeth isn't here anymore well, to, to give us her. Well, I did, I did approach Archwell, as you have to as a journalist, to say, look, would you like to say anything? And there's been a deafening silence. The only thing I've seen is a report in a US magazine. From a source close to the Sussexes, saying they're really bemused. This has come out now. We would never would have done it unless we'd had the support of the Queen. We feel this is part of an ongoing smear campaign against us. But I genuinely don't know how much credence to give that. Well, you know, in, to that interesting as well. Sourcing. Sorry to interrupt. Sorry. Interesting as well. There's Natasha. There's also been reports that these revelations have actually been well received by the palace. Yeah, it's been reported that some. Palace insiders were kind of relieved that this version of events has come out.、Um, obviously, Prince Harry has very much given his version of events in, you know, with the Oprah interview and with his book Spare.、Um, and the Sun's kind of legendary royal photographer Arthur Edwards even went further to say, you know, this is kind of a version of revenge served cold <laughs>、um, from some courtiers. Which again, are, you know, I'm not sure about that. But、um, yeah, I think if there was a feeling. That this version of events was inaccurate, then yes, it's been happy. They're happy that the record has been corrected. I think. Sorry, Joe. I was going to、okay. say. I think people do feel very. They were very protective of the Queen when she was alive,、yeah. and very protective of her memory. Now that she's no、yeah. longer with us, and you know, even when she was alive, they felt she couldn't really speak for herself. Sometimes,、yeah. um, I don't think anyone wants to. Ignite, you know,、uh, another row with the the Sussexes. But you're right. I think there are other people who've had a quiet smile of satisfaction that maybe now people know、and、that there is a very different version of events. Really, it's just not very hard to do, is it, to ignite a row with the Sussexes? No. no. <laughs> well, there was something so patronising though about all that talk we heard、um, over and over from Prince Harry about, oh, you know, my grandmother being kept apart. You know, she's she can't see me. She's not allowed to do this when. You know, this was a woman who had all her mental faculties there. I mean, my goodness, she met the new prime minister, Liz Truss, who said that she had, you know, twenty-minute meeting with her, and she was fully engaged. Wasn't that the day before her death? A couple yeah, forty-eight, forty-eight hours. Couple of days, days before hours. her death, and insisted on, and this is in Robert's book again. Despite the pain she was in, standing. That's right. To, to greet both her outgoing prime minister and her incoming prime minister, and I think it just shows that woman's strength of character, her dignity, her devotion to、and、to it, duty, and, sense of responsibility.、Um, yeah. yeah. And perhaps、yeah. most telling detail is that none of that Lilibet Rao features in Prince Harry's memoirs spare,、mm. and I suspect that's because you know it's too awkward to get into the grisly details. Well, I'm sure you will have a lot to say on this subject this week, our dear viewers. But let's have some of your comments about last week's show. Now, Deborah Wolfeld was one of a number of you unhappy that Prince Harry was to be given an award as a legend of aviation. A legend. She writes, "I just sent Living Legends of Aviation an email about their award selection process. I find it disturbing that Prince Harry will be listed with astronauts and other real contributors to aerospace aviation." I also like to comment that has been had me chuckling ever since. Somebody saying, "Anybody else imagine Harry running around the room with his arms out, making engine noises?" I'm sorry, I don't have your name to hand, but hats off, chef's kiss for that one. <laughs> Meanwhile, Julia McDonald was one of a number of you defending the Prince and Princess of Wales for taking on fewer duties to focus on raising their family. Well, that's come to the fore this week, hasn't it? She says raising the next generation of royals is a huge priority for the Waleses. They are quite right to focus on this. And after we reported that Catherine might be in line to join the Order of the Garter, Shannon Schaefer calls for another senior royal to get the nod. What about the Duchess of Edinburgh? She should be awarded the Order of the Garter. She's certainly earned the recognition. And writing after last week's show, Judy Taylor says, "Princess Anne is my hero. What a remarkable person." Well, you're in luck, Judy, because we've got a lot more about Anne, including some of her best looks, coming up later in the show. Thank you so much for your comments. Please do keep them coming in. We read them all. Even the nasty ones. And、oh, I、maybe. like I like、no. that comment about the 
uh, Duchess of Edinburgh because I I agree yeah, with that. Yeah, I think that I think they might. You know, the, we had a crystal ball. We think that that probably might happen at some yeah, stage. Yeah, I'd know? like to think so. Now we missed you last week, Rebecca, because you were in the north of England with William, the Prince of Wales. What what was going on? Yeah, so it was his first engagement of the year, and obviously, given the sad news this week, it might be his last engagement for a little bit. Um, but he went up to Leeds because he was presenting CBEs to two amazing motor neuron campaigners, Rob Burrow, who is a former professional rugby league player who sadly got this incurable degenerative disease, and his best friend, Kevin Sinfield, who has helped raise millions of pounds for charity through endurance efforts. And so they've been ordered CBEs in the New Year's honours. Rob's health is sadly failing. He's unable to talk and is now confined to a wheelchair. So uh, the the mountain came to Mohammed, Mm -hmm. and um, William decided to bring their CBEs to them and present them. And it was just, it was a really moving occasion. And William was so brilliant because obviously Rob can only converse by tapping out, uh, not tapping out, he actually uses his eyes to kind of blink out right. messages on a computer screen. So he'd prepared some answers, but he can really emote with his eyes as well. And William really connected with him. And you could see how moved William was to be able to do it. It was, it was a really special oh, event. What's it like to be part of that? Must have just been so emotional. It, it it was, and what was lovely is they had because it wasn't at the palace where they have limited numbers. They could have all their families there. I should explain it was at the um, the Leeds Rhinos Rugby Club where both men used to play, and so they could have their children there. And they were we were waiting in the room before William arrived, and the little girls were practicing their curtsies and saying how excited they were. And the little boy was like running around. He was he was like a kind of mini Prince Louis. You can imagine <laughs> running around, kind of taking books out the goodie bags to have a look to it. And it, so it was just a really lovely family occasion. Oh. And you can't do that for everyone, but obviously yeah. it was a very special one for oh, them. that's amazing. Now, I want to move on to what's fast becoming a regular Princess Anne slot. Uh, last week, we discussed her carrying her own bags off the plane in no-nonsense style as she landed in Sri Lanka. And this week, the praise for the Princess Royal just keeps on coming, uh, from fashion royalty, no less. Now, I'm going to get the name right, if it kills me. Sylvia Venturini Fendi of the House Fendi has revealed that Anne's outfit at her brother's coronation last year was the inspiration for Fendi's new menswear collection, which was shown in Milan Men's last wear, week. Menswear, did you say? Men, it's, it's, yes, my, my daughter works at Gucci, <laughs> so I know it's menswear week in Milan this week. And so she also called the 73-year-old princess the most elegant woman in the world. Now, I don't know if you've seen the Fendi show, but it's there are more masculine collections out there. So that might, that, to, to, just to ebb away some of your confusion there, Richard. But that is high praise indeed, isn't it, Natasha? Yeah, I mean, the collection is a lot of kind of raincoats and quite sort of sturdy fashion wear, which Princess Anne is definitely a fan of. I saw a maxi skirt. Well, there yeah. you go. <laughs> um, but yeah, Princess Anne definitely has an interesting sense of style. I also love she has these Adidas sports sunglasses, which she wore in Sri Lanka, and she's had for more than a decade. It doesn't matter. She keeps recycling them. They keep coming out, and I love it. Um, but I think she's a classic example of, you know, it's not what you wear, but how you wear it. And she pulls everything off with kind of that steely confidence that she's known for. And that make do and mend grit. Yeah, <laughs> we like that, don't we? Uh, Rebecca, I think we can probably all confidently say that this praise from fashion royalty will not go to Anne's head. I think we can safely predict that that is the case, Joe. Can we she safely would say she hasn't even noticed. I, I doubt she. I doubt she would have. I've done. I've. I've I find, I think I've said to you on the programme before, I find it quite scary when I do engagements with her. She's quite brusque and very like... Um, And what I love is apparently the designer was inspired by the outfit she wore to the King's coronation where she was invited to wear full military uniform and the trousers and the big plumed hat. And then they started looking back at her fashion. I was like... She's great, but I, you know, I, I love Come Princess on, Anne. that plumed hat came in very useful. Well, yes, I, I knew Richard would remember that <laughs> bitchy little detail. <laughs> well, actually, Robert refers to that in his book. I feel like that's the refrain of the show, and Robert says this in his book this week. Uh, sorry if I'm going to bore the viewers with it, but he actually, because he actually got to interview Prince Anne, Princess Anne, and he asked her about it, and she said, well, that hat wasn't my idea. I said, you sure? It's a big hat. Are you sure you don't want me to wear it? And they went, 
Yeah, and she was only sitting where she was, she said, because she needed to make a speedy exit, so they changed the seats. But God bless her. That's okay. We believe her. We believe <laughs> yeah, her. Yeah, we do. I mean, I've done, in my magazine editor days, done lots of stories about what a style icon Anne was and has been since the 60s and 70s. I think she's amazing. But, you know, you, we talk about the no-nonsense, rather brusque Anne, but Richard, in Robert Hardman's book, there's a really sweet anecdote, isn't there, about Anne on the day that the Queen passed away? Yeah, it's very touching. I mean, obviously, that, that was one of the most um, dramatic and memorable days of their lives. And, um, you know, we heard how King Charles um, learnt that his mother had died. And that's because his private secretary referred, him as, referred to him as your majesty. So that's how he knew. And then Princess Anne was greeted by, um, I think, a member of staff at Balmoral who gave her a big hug. And Princess Anne sort of was slightly bewildered, as I think, and sort of turned around and said, well, that won't happen again. <laughs> but took the hug. Tell me <laughs> she, she took the she hug. She did take the hug and was, <laughs> was grateful, yeah. Aww. And the star, the star person said, like, I wouldn't normally do it, but she looked so distressed standing there. It was yeah. just a, a normal, kind of instinctive human reaction. And she did definitely accept it in the, in the spirit that it was delivered, but was like very much like going, OK, right. Yeah. Emotion yeah. over, let's just now Never get again. on with it. Well, we don't want to let this celebration of Anne style go unmarked. So here is a celebration of our own favourite outfits worn by Princess Anne over the years. Enjoy. I wouldn't be surprised if that montage influenced the collections of a few more designers. Let's return briefly now to Robert Hardman, who tells us the rather moving details that he learnt about the day that the world said goodbye to Queen Elizabeth II. What really struck me, and, and, and I hope this comes through in my book, is the suddenness of the Queen's passing. Um, yes, we knew she'd had mobility issues for some time, but I think we were all greatly buoyed by that famous picture of her on the day she'd appointed Liz Truss as Prime Minister, and you saw her there with a sort of glint in her eye. Um, and it was sort of, you know, for her, that's what, that's what I'm about. You could see her thinking, you know, I'm here, constitutional monarch, my number one duty is to ensure the smooth government of the country, and I you know, you know, didn't have a Prime Minister effectively over the summer. Um, and finally, things are back in order, and she'd done it um, with great dignity and style. And I think we all sort of heaved a bit of a sigh of relief, and life carried on. And then it was the following day, the following evening, that suddenly the Queen wasn't feeling well enough to do her Privy Council meeting, even though it was just going to be done down an audio link. And people started thinking, well, hang on, that's, that's not good. Um, and then the next morning, um, the Prince of Wales flew up to Balmoral, and clearly she'd taken a turn for the worse. Everybody knew that. But still at that point, I think people thought, you know, the, there's no immediate, there's no great rush. I mean, obviously, we need to, everybody should start making their way up here. Um, but what no one was expecting was her to have this sudden, um, very rapid decline. Um, so that, you know, by mid-afternoon, um, the king was being addressed as your majesty for the first time. And he was still trying to make his way back from Burke Hall to Balmoral Castle. He'd seen the Queen earlier in the day. I think it's very important that he had been to see her that day and had spent a good hour at her bedside. So, um, you know, that, that was, for him, I think, really important. But uh, people have said to me, well, why, why did it take the royal family so long to get up there? Well, I mean, you know, Balmoral is not the easiest place to get to. Uh, they'd all started making tracks that day. Um, but events just overtook them. And, and then we hear this, this fascinating, very moving story of the um, 
the last red box. You know, and you think she had these these red boxes coming into her life for seventy years. You know, every day as a young mother, a middle aged, as a pensioner. Um, there was the red box every day full of bits of paper that needed reading, signing approvals, some of it quite interesting, some of it very interesting, a lot of it very boring. Uh, always had to be done, had to be dealt with. If you let it stack up, you, you'd basically lose, lose sight of everything. Um, and there was the last red box and it was handed over to her private secretary who opened it. And inside uh, was a letter to... Um, to her private secretary, Sir Edward Young, um, a letter to the Prince of Wales, now King, obviously, and um, the last document that she'd handled, and it was uh, it was the list of nominations for the Order of Merit, which was a very distinguished order of very eminent people for exceptional meritorious service. She took it very seriously. It wasn't like the honours system, which is something for the government. It's very much a, a monarch um, honour. Uh, and she circled and underlined her, her nominations, and that was the last document she ever held. <laughs> and as I write in the book, you know, I mean, here's someone we all know. We all know how hard she worked, her sense of duty. But you know, even on her deathbed, she had work to do, and she did it. <sighs> Moving stuff, all right. A reminder that Robert Hardman's book, Charles the Third, New King, New Court: The Inside Story, is out now, and there will be a link to buy it in the description below. We'll post more of that interview with Robert on the channel on Monday, so look out for that. My thanks to him, Rebecca, Natasha, and Richard, and to you always for watching. We'll see you next week. Bye bye.